everyone, and welcome to uh, the Defeat This Defeat Diabetes webinar on uh, on women's health. And uh, we're very excited that um, we have a very special guest tonight to uh, tell us all about matters related to women's health and nutrition. And uh, that's Dr. Deepa. So Deepa, lovely to uh, to have you uh, today and um, welcome. Thanks, Peter. It's really nice to be on this webinar tonight speaking about women's health. Great. I've heard Deepa speak on this subject before and uh, she's a wealth of knowledge. And uh, so let's get straight into it. Well, actually, now, before we get straight into it, tell us a little bit about your your uh, career deeper and how you finished up in the sort of the low carb uh, space. We'd love to hear your journey. Sure. So uh, basically, I think um, it basically arcs back to my desire to become a general practitioner. And that was very early on in high school. So went through medical school, graduated in 2012 and fast forward into general practice training. And then finally, getting to work with patients and get hold of their preventative health. And that's really what drove me to that spot in the first place. But I think very quickly I started to learn that in general practice, the sad reality was that instead of preventing disease, we were really just band-aiding disease and giving out a lot of prescription medication to people and unfortunately just losing sight of what I had thought general practice was all about. So that led me into the low carbohydrate medicine space. And I also simultaneously had my own sort of health issues at the time, one of which was being diagnosed with stage four endometriosis just soon after I left medical school. So I think it was that culmination of using different strategies for myself and um, and also seeing what my patients were doing and starting to learn from them as well. And then starting to get the knowledge around low carbohydrate medicine and truly understanding what that, what that meant. And I think the pivotal moment was when we, um, myself um, and Alex, my husband, who's also a doctor, we attended the Low Carb Down Under conference on the Gold Coast in 2017. And that was phenomenal. It just cemented uh, why this was a very uh, plausible mechanism that had lots of evidence that had supported it and it was just evidence that I was completely unaware of. So I think once we learnt more about that, uh, we were able to then apply that further with patients and just see absolutely fantastic results in uh, over, over a range of medical conditions, not just you know, to, um, just diabetes related, but many other things that started to improve for our patients. So that's sort of where we got to. And at that stage, we had um, a desire to really make this m more uh, or to focus this on focus on this area for our career and developed a clinic, which is called Sydney Low Carb Specialists. And we founded that in 2019. And I call it my third child because I was pregnant at the time with my second child. <laughs> and that's a multidisciplinary clinic where we've now got doctors, a dietitian, a health coach and an exercise physiologist where we work in a very integrated manner with our patients to try and uh, either set up a low carb lifestyle or to troubleshoot low carb lifestyles and apply them across either a range of chronic conditions or even with just optimizing general health as well. So it's uh, been an incredibly satisfying way to practice medicine, particularly when you see your patients get better. Yeah, I think that's the case. I think so many uh, doctors these days just just don't don't get any satisfaction out of uh, out of medicine. They're just writing script and writing uh, certificates and so on and uh, and uh, those of us who've discovered the sort of the the low carb way of uh, of, uh, of treating chronic disease it's uh, it's enormously satisfying and i know david unwin talks a lot about the, the british gp that we've had on this webinars before talks about uh, he was all set to retire because he just stopped enjoying medicine and then he had a new lease of life so it's true look we won't uh, let's not uh, dilly dally we've got lots to talk about there are so many topics and uh, some of the topics i want to get through uh, tonight are um PCOS, so polycystic ovary syndrome, which is extremely common in, in somewhat younger women um, associated with infertility. So we'll talk a little bit about fertility. We'll cover um, endometriosis, uh, both from your own experience and, and yours with, uh, with patients. And, uh, and we'll do a quick uh, 
run through gestational diabetes as well. And then I want to spend the sort of the second half of the uh, of the show really uh, talking about menopause and post perimenopausal and postmenopausal issues. That uh, and I think that's what a lot of our uh, our audience are. Uh, are concerned about but we'll come back to that in a little while let's start with uh, let's start with pcos as i said polycystic ovary syndrome um and to be honest i had no idea that pcos was as common uh, as it is so tell us a little bit about pcos yeah so pcos is incredibly common it affects uh, up to 13 percent of australian women and that number rises in indigenous women almost 20 percent of those women are affected by this condition and it's, it's rather than a disease itself, it's really just a, a spectrum. It's a, a syndrome, a cluster of different uh, features that are all occurring um, in a particular woman. And they may only have one or two of those features. And that's all where I sort of define it as mild, moderate, severe, and, and really crossing a whole range of um, conditions. Many women may know of it as affecting their menstrual cycles. So they often either get very irregular, irregular periods or they may miss periods or even um, just have uh, uh, cycles that um, where they're not ovulating. So that's one of the, the big features. But other things that tend to happen are issues with um, hirsutism, which is hair growth in unwanted spots. Acne is also a big feature of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then there's, of course, the cysts themselves, which it's all a bit of a misnomer because many of the women who are actually affected by polycystic ovarian syndrome actually don't even have that feature on ultrasound. So uh, there are also some other uh, symptoms like hair loss uh, that's associated with it. So it's really characterised um, from a chemical level uh, about 70% of women who suffer from PCOS have insulin resistance. So it's quite a high number of women uh, that have this condition who get a, um, who have this insulin resistance. And that the problem with having high levels of insulin and also high levels of circulating blood sugars is that it affects the liver and the liver then actually reduces its production of a particular molecule, which is called sex hormone binding globulin. Now, when this molecule is quite low, we tend to get a rise in, or an unchecked rise in what we call free androgens. And these are uh, particularly masculinizing to a woman. So this, these are things like testosterone and something called DHEAS, um, which is a precursor to some of our sex hormones. So that's kind of where the, the hair growth and uh, issues with um, uh, acne as well come from. So it's that real hormonal imbalance that, that results. So there are, it's, it's a lot of, there are a cluster of changes happening in this condition, but it's remarkable that so much of it can be related back to something like having high insulin levels. And it really speaks to where we need to go to treat that condition. So uh, someone comes into your clinic and you diagnose them with, with PCOS. What's the first uh, thing you'd recommend for them? So the first thing we'd recommend and traditionally standard of care would be actually starting to reach for the prescription pad because that's that's sort of been the, the go-to thing, things like metformin or putting someone on an oral contraceptive pill and things like clomiphene and spironolactone to treat um, other things that are related like, like fertility, particularly with clomiphene, so getting a woman to ovulate again. But uh, what I do these days is um, I start to speak with them about this uh, factor called insulin resistance and how we might be able to turn that around by simply choosing different foods that are not producing a large spike in insulin levels. And insulin is produced by the pancreas. And we know that if someone is already vulnerable to making large amounts of that, we can start to get cells that are becoming immune to that signal. So they're starting to get deafened by the sound of this insulin. So they're really unable to then take in um, ex extra blood sugar that is in the bloodstream. And that then leads to higher levels of blood sugar as well within the bloodstream. So it's really a domino effect. So that's the first thing we would reach for is a lifestyle change. And 
some of the other things we speak about as well that surround that are it, it's uh, one of the associated uh, risks with PCOS is overweight and obesity. So that's also a massive area where we want to also advise women on how they can reduce some of the uh, chemicals that may be entering their bodies as well. So we talk about these things that are called endocrine disruptors. And these are chemicals in our environment that we might ingest, inhale, um, uh, or even eat um, inadvertently or unknowingly. And they basically enter our blood and can mimic our own hormones. And unfortunately, this then interferes and interrupts with our own hormone signaling, which is actually a large part of what's also going on with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we also chat about that lifestyle side of things as well, environmental exposures. Right. What are the, some of the common environmental exposures that you've seen? So some of the common ones are things like parabens um, and uh, things like uh, dioxins as well, which uh, live in the environment. And there are also um, things that people may have heard of are BPA, which is actually something that many plastic products uh, often used to contain before they got banned. But we know that BPA has been largely eliminated from the production of plastic, but there are many, many other uh, chemicals that actually mimic the action of these particular plastics and have been studied fairly widely in preclinical studies and in, in mice and have demonstrated all sorts of side effects, which are you know not really the kind of thing that uh, women would be wanting to be ingesting, given that we just don't know and we are quite unsure about what these long-term effects are going to be. So one of the easiest and simplest ways to look at it is to start to look at what you cook your food in uh, and move away from plastics and Teflon and use things like cast iron uh, and store uh, food in glass containers, don't reheat things in plastic either. And even so simple things like your coffee cup. So they're often lined with uh, chemicals that can be um, ingested and mimic your own hormones. So the heat applied to those particular packaging can actually trigger that uh, issue and worsen the amount of those chemicals that transition into your coffee. And therefore, you can get this, this issue happening as well. Uh, the other things are perfumes and fragrances and makeup, and there are many options now on the market for low toxin products that are actually trying to reduce some of these things, such as phthalates and um, parabens. So I think that's really key, a key factor, given that women disproportionately will be using some of these products and are unknowingly uh, contributing to problems like uh, hormonal imbalances that then can cause gynecological disorders. Right, fascinating. So, but but really, the first step is is diet, isn't it? I mean, it's just to you know the, to tackle the insulin resistance is by by reducing your uh, your carbohydrate intake. Absolutely, and I think that's a key. It's a foundational factor in uh, approaching this condition. So the key things that people would be looking to reduce that are very high in carbohydrates are the highly processed foods. So these are typically what you'd find in the supermarket as packaged. They are usually from grain-based um, products. And then there are those things that are uh, high in fructose, so things like soft drinks. And uh, then there are the chocolates and biscuits and many of these um, products that are basically what we'd class as those processed foods. Then the other things to look at for women to reduce would be uh, certain starchy vegetables, which can be quite high in carbohydrate. There are certain fruits that are also quite high in carbohydrate, particularly the fructose load. And then trying to replace within their diet higher whole foods, uh, such as pr uh, proteins um, that are found naturally, so this could be uh, both um, vegetarian-based proteins in the form of dairy products and um, eggs, if that's tolerated in a vegetarian diet. And then um, also including high quality full fat meats. And those, those products are, or those foods are basically going to reduce the amount of blood sugar that is existing in the bloodstream. And in someone who's already vulnerable to having high insulin levels, this is wonderful because it just reduces their production of insulin. So the pancreas starts to get a, take a breather and it can even start to uh, heal as well. So there's a concept of pancreatic beta cell retrieval and um, 
and even emerging evidence that there's regeneration, the sooner you can act upon uh, the um, problems with overproduction of insulin by the pancreas. So just by making a few simple changes to the diet, you can already start to see in women that many will then spontaneously start to ovulate again and get a return to their menstrual cycles. And that's quite critical when it comes to particularly the time in a woman's life when they're considering having a baby and trying to regulate and have a very um, uh, predictable menstrual cycle. Because I highly believe that a menstrual cycle is a woman's vital sign and it should be added to one of those vital signs that we should be checking when we are actually reviewing women, you know, not just blood pressure and heart rate, but actually looking at um, how predictable is your menstrual cycle. Yes, and we, we know that PCOS is, is probably the most common cause of, uh, of infertility in young, young women, along with endometriosis, which we'll get to. But, uh, I mean, what about, uh, I'm sure you have uh, patients and, and probably friends uh, and, and uh, who come who have having problems uh, getting pregnant uh, with their problems with their fertility, and um, you put them on a, uh, on a, you know, a low carbohydrate sort of anti-inflammatory type diet and... Uh, and the the uh, success rate is remarkable. It it is it, it's uh, and also for people as well, couples who weren't even intending on pregnancy, which is uh, you know they actually end up falling pregnant. So it can actually be something that we warn people about when they go onto a low carbohydrate diet, because you may actually get a uh, return to ovulation and. Um, and also very increase your chances of fertility, not only because you're ovulating again, but also because you're starting to consume what is a far higher nutrient dense uh, foods uh, in, in your diet. So often when people are eating a standard dietary um, uh, pattern um, and having a lot of whole grains, what is going on is that the nutrients that are in these things are often fortified. So they're having um, added folate into this these foods and um, often iodized salt and even thiamine, which is fortified in the food supply in Australia. So you're getting your nutrients, but you're actually getting your nutrients in a very artificial way. And the absorption and utilization of synthetic nutrients we know is a lot, um, uh, or it's more subpar than if you're actually extracting nutrients in their natural state and form and then you're actually better able to utilize them and absorb them into the multiple pathways that are needed within the cells to produce energy. So it is actually really key that when you take on a whole food dietary approach that is much lower in carbohydrates, you actually find that you're starting to increase and improve the nutrient profile. And that is really important for a woman who is at the time of uh, thinking about preconception and then hoping to carry on a pregnancy and supply adequate nutrients to their baby as well for growth and development. Mm. Yes, I had one of my colleagues at work uh, a few months ago came to have a chat and uh, and and talked about her problems about uh, fertility. They've been trying for some time to get pregnant, and uh, I had a chat and gave her a copy of my book. And uh, two months later, she came back in with a big smile and said uh, it worked. And um, you know, I. We've, we've all had lots of those uh, situations. I mean, I'm not suggesting it's a, it's a guarantee, but uh, it's remarkable how often uh, people who are having trouble getting pregnant um, get to uh, change their diet and, and achieve a pregnancy. But um, we, we let's talk about the other sort of uh, form of, of uh, infertil cause of infertility and, and, and problems in, uh, in younger women, uh, and that's endometriosis. And uh, mm. I think, you know, it's a massive uh, problem in our society. It seems to be getting more common. I don't know whether that's your impression as well, but, uh, um, and, you know, generally not that well treated. I mean, uh, most you know, doctors uh, will make the diagnosis and then send you off for a for a, for a surgery, for a laparoscopic uh, surgery and so on, which may or may not uh, may not help. So tell us your approach to uh, to the, the patient who comes in with endometriosis. Mm, so often uh, the person who um, has endometriosis and doesn't even know about it, often those key symptoms that tip me off that it could be at play 
uh, that they're uh, complaining of pain and fairly debilitating pain at that. So that's on every menstrual cycle and maybe even in the lead up to their periods uh, and during their periods as well. They, they may also be experiencing fairly heavy breathing, uh, bleeding and pain that um, radiates down their, the back of their legs um, and, and also into all sorts of other places as well. So it can be quite an uncomfortable and painful uh, condition to the point that it can debilitate women uh, that they can't to the point they can't even work so it can affect their quality of life quite dramatically and the other issue that uh, women with endometriosis have is that they find that they uh, particularly if they're at the time of um, preconception that they may not be falling pregnant easily and the reason for this is that the condition itself is uh, really where the lining of the uterus is growing in spots it should not be. So you might find these spots that are called endometriomas growing in the ovaries, inside the fallopian tubes, outside of the uterus, outside the bladder, outside the colon as well. And even in, I think in the literature, they find it, found it as widespread as the diaphragm and, and beyond. So it can be an incredibly painful condition. And these endometriomas basically grow every time the menstrual cycle repeats itself. So with women um, who are affected by this condition, we need to think about what are all of the uh, co the causes or the mechanisms for why this has occurred. And there are actually a raft of reasons and there's a lot of research that's been done into possible mechanisms, some of which actually revolve around um, endocrine issues. So, you know, people who are actually experiencing overweight and obesity and having that secondary to insulin resistance, there is an association between that and the development of endometriosis. There's also uh, those women who are experiencing high levels of inflammation and some of the particular molecules that are um, implicated in that are uh, things like TNF-alpha and IL-6, which are these inflammatory mediators that can worsen the growth of endometriosis. Um, and we also see in women um, that they, ha they may have genetic effects, so they may have a mother or a sister who was affected by this condition, and uh, they also may be consuming quite a highly inflammatory diet as well. So things like seed oils, uh, for instance, which are quite high in um, omega-6 comparative to omega-3. And uh, we know that ancestrally sort of the ratio of consumption for that has been one is to one. But these days in a standard diet, we can see the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 being as high as 30 is to one. So it's quite a difference in what would have been a very ideal diet for pregnancy, uh, which is uh, trying to consume natural fats that really don't have high omega-6 loads. Um, and there is also some other, uh, you know, mechanisms that are at play. But I think one of the key things with any woman who's presenting with this condition is not to sort of jump straight away to um, think about it purely as how do we... Uh, get rid of the disease, although that is really, that is part of the treatment in terms of reducing pain. And that's where the surgeries come in because you can actually reduce the amount of endometriosis that is there and that by default reduces pain. But it's also about thinking of how you can prevent it from returning because there are 50% of women actually have recurrence within five years of surgery. And that actually is quite a high number. So what we want to try to do is get to the root of the inflammatory causes and possibly the cardiometabolic causes as well that are implicated. And that to a degree uh, is likely to have some impact on the severity of the disease. I think the other key factor is that a person who is on a very low carb diet may tend to produce ketones and ketones themselves, which are basically a, um, uh, are free fatty acids that are combined together to create a ketone. Those are really important in inducing an anti-inflammatory effect. And so they can be quite relevant in pain uh, management. So we know that there's a lot of research around that area in terms of therapeutic ketosis. So 
we don't we, the the evidence uh there at the moment is still quite scant and i think that just speaks to you know the large lack of interest in looking at diet and particularly ketosis in endometriosis but i think that um we will be seeing more emerging evidence to that end yes i mean uh, we've, we've talked about the possibility of doing some research ourselves, haven't we, Deepa? So I think uh, no one else seems to be going to do it, so maybe we might have to do it uh, do it ourselves. Um, look, I want to, uh, we, we're, we're racing through uh, time here. I, I want to really um, focus on on the problems around uh, the menopause, sort of perimenopausal symptoms and postmenopausal issues that uh, mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, a lot of our, our listeners are in, in that sort of a stage of their of their life. And uh and complaining of uh, of you know weight gain and and uh, uh, metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes and so on, why why is that uh, you know are they vulnerable at that time of their life to that to those sort of conditions? Yes, it's really common. I see a lot of women who walk in and tell me that they whatever they're trying now to try and manage their body composition and it is not working anymore when they're hitting their 40s and 50s. And what used to work in their 20s and 30s just doesn't anymore. So this is often in the presentation of weight gain because that's one of the things they can see is actually visibly happening to them around this, this time in their lives. And what is happening around menopause is actually not just a sudden drop off in hormones, but uh, a, a decline over many, many years in some cases. Um, because average age of menopause, which is defined as not having periods for at least 12 months, happens around 50 to 51 years of age. But it can actually happen to women anywhere after the age of 40 and happen all the way up until 60. So it, it could happen at any time um, in a woman's life. And what we really see is this time of perimenopause. So a long descent into a reduced, uh, a reduction in estrogen particularly, and then also a reduction in progesterone. And it's interesting because the type of estrogen that is dominant in premenopausal women is the estradiol or E2. And this particular type of estrogen uh, tends to confer increased insulin sensitivity, which is great for premenopausal pre women because often women are actually at far lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes in their 30s and 40s um, and even in their early 50s compared to men. But as soon as they start to lose this estrogen, that's when they start to see worsening insulin resistance. And there is a, a, a real connection between these two hormones that many women are not even aware of. So whilst they're over here sort of beating themselves up, thinking, oh, it's, it's you know, what I'm eating or am I not exercising or I'm not exercising enough and thinking that it's all because of them and, and that they're not, that they need to work harder somehow. I really want women to know that it's actually not their fault. This is a physiological change that happens to all women. And so what we need to do is actually be conscious of that, be aware of it, and then start to understand that yes, then the way you eat does need to change in a way because to mitigate the risks of worsening insulin resistance, we need to then start to address what, it, you know, the foods that are going to cause a, a, um, a rise in insulin itself. So I always think that women who are heading into menopause actually should start to be making changes as early as possible, you know, in their 40s. Um, to head off some of the issues that they'll have once the insulin resistance start, hits. So what sort of changes are you talking about? Yeah, so those changes are, are focusing on, um, again, reducing those ultra-processed foods, uh, reducing the amount of seed oil consumption, looking at lowering fructose and glucose as much as possible in the foods that they consume, and really starting to focus on a whole food um, approach, as well as I think the other key thing for women is to note that um, they'll get a redistribution in fat. And unfortunately, that is due to then this transition of reducing all, you know, most of your estradiol, which is that E2 type estrogen. And you do actually still make some kind, you do make an estrogen after menopause, which is actually called estrone, and that's E1. 
So estrone does work against women because it uh, basically um, redistributes the, or basically that, that is produced in fat cells. And the fat tends to get redistributed from being underneath the skin, which is a subcutaneous fat, to being fat that's around the abdominal area, particularly around organs and even within organs if the person heading into menopause has already got a problem with metabolic health. So this estrone that gets produced um, is actually made from those masculine, masculinizing androgens. So that DHEAS we spoke about earlier in regards to polycystic ovarian syndrome then starts to turn itself within fat cells into estrone. And estrone is quite inflammatory and uh, then it kind of worsens this whole issue with, um, with uh, putting on um, added, like fat tissue around the abdomen, basically. So the key factors with that are that um, with lowering your glucose intake from your food, you're not really worsening a insulin response and you aren't actually adding to that whole mixture with um, a whole lot of uh, triglycerides that get produced by the liver. So you're trying to take away some of the brunt that's already happening with this production of estrone. So the other uh, very useful strategy for women around perimenopause and going into the postmenopausal phase is that fasting can be incredibly useful. So starting to look at your eating window and potentially considering moving your three meals a day down to two meals a day and even in some circumstances one meal a day where you can start to feel intuitive hunger and fullness and understand the difference between the two can be really useful and i actually think women in postmenopause, particularly the women i see in my clinic they are probably some of the best fasters i've ever met because it suddenly becomes a lot easier to fast when you don't have a menstrual cycle. And fasting when you've got a menstrual cycle or you've somewhat got a little bit of a period and then it disappears for a few months and at that time of perimenopause can be quite tricky because we know that the menstrual cycle is sort of divided up into two phases. And the first phase is when it is easier to fast, that's the first 14 days. And the second phase, which leads up to the time of a period, is a lot more difficult. And that's just because it's more progesterone dominated and it often leads women to crave uh, um, foods and that's really a call out from the body for some extra glucose to assist in progesterone production. So what I advise with fasting is if you've still got a cycle or somewhat of a cycle, a semblance of a cycle, then it's really key to try and fast with the rhythm of the menstrual cycle. Um, and then if you actually have no menstrual cycle whatsoever, then you can really launch into uh, a fasting routine and even ensure there's some variation to that fast as well so that the body doesn't become too predictable in, in what's given. Because a slight stressor to the body is a good thing every now and then. They call those things the hormetic stresses that can be quite beneficial. So you talk about fasting being... Uh this time restricted eating that they refer to. So you have to do all your eating within a, say a six hour window. So you might have your two meals at midday and 6 PM or something like that, or even just, as you mentioned, one meal a day. Mm -hmm. What about uh, longer fasts? There are some people who advocate, you know, 24, 48, even 72 hour fasts as a sort of a circuit breaker and, and so on. And I know of, you know, people who do that monthly and, and swear by it. What, what's your advice or what's your experience with the, that type of fasting? So that type of fasting, particularly at uh, the postmenopausal phase, is actually quite useful. So if you take a fast beyond 36 hours, you start to enter into a process which is called autophagy, and you get the cleanup, essentially, of debris within and around cells, uh, and a uh, it's almost a reboot to the headquarters of your cells, what we call the mitochondria. And this particular type of fasting can be wonderful in terms of uh, prevention of certain uh, diseases, things like mild cognitive impairment that can then lead into Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, we know that uh, if we can start to reduce some of the um, 
the glucose load, which is what fasting does. It really brings down your blood sugar level to a very reasonably well-controlled number that uh, we can see improvement in your cognition and mental clarity during the fast. And the cells tend to work better after the fast is broken. So it's a, a one, it is actually a great circuit breaker in a way. So uh, a wonderful way to clean up um, some of these cells that were already on their way out, but actually just starting to accumulate. So that these, the other uh, way in which this is quite useful, and there's been some literature to this end, is in uh, cancer prevention as well. So uh, we often think about cancer cells actually being in everybody. We all have them. It's just that our body is very good at cleaning them up and recognising them and stopping their ongoing production. So these are these precancerous cells that we really want to try and clean up as much as possible. And there's been great evidence to show that uh, using some form of time-restricted um, uh, eating, uh, whether that be, you know, one or two meals a day or even these longer fasts that people enter into, that can actually help to give a cumulative effect to uh, reducing some of these um, damaged cells, which is excellent. So, and I can hear our listeners saying right now, but, you know, it's so hard. How can you possibly fast for that long? I just get too hungry. Mm. But it's not the case, is it? No. So interestingly, people, when they're initially given the idea of fasting, can can find that that's quite a mountainous task to to uh, you know overcome, and I think the key for many patients and people that we see is that they should start to adapt their metabolism to be able to use another form of fuel. So generally speaking, if someone's eating a, a fairly standard diet, they are mostly functioning on sugars, blood sugar, um, and glucose, and when you start to go on a lower carbohydrate approach, you become better at using and releasing from your fat stores some energy. And this is in the form of fatty acids, and then you can make ketones from the liver. So the ability to use ketones and glucose is actually a, uh, a, uh, it's a superhuman power. It's a, it's a power that we all have, and we were all born in ketosis essentially. So we all can do this, it's just that we have been so, in terms of a modernised diet, have actually kind of dampened our ability to use those ketones because most of the time we're not able to even get rid of this excessive blood sugar that's around. So the ketones themselves, once you're able to utilise them, you start to also signal fullness. So there is this dampening of a hunger signal that goes to a control centre in the brain, which is the hypothalamus. And a lot of people start to report they're just not as hungry anymore when they've got the presence of even a few of these ketones circulating. So as that metabolic adaptation occurs, which usually takes about three months for elite athletes, so for you and I, it's going to take a lot longer to get there, um, but it does happen and it drives over a, over a number of months, you start to be able to then enter into fasts without even needing to think about food, getting cravings for food and feeling any um, hunger that comes in. And if there is hunger, it's often transient and there are often many ways to get around that transient hunger. It's usually from boredom or even just habituation with the need to have, you know, two or three meals a day. And I always think that fasting is probably something that shouldn't be thrown in straight away into the mix if someone is going low carb. I think it's something that should gradually come with time particularly these longer fasts I don't think are uh, easy to achieve when you're at the beginning, but there's certainly something that you can do once you've been eating in a low-carb way for, for several months. Yes, and look, and it's, we're coming up with a lot of the questions too about, uh, about women who, uh, who go low-carb and uh, unlike their, uh, their male counterpart who weight just falls off them when they, when they go uh, low-carb, mm. There are many peri perimenopausal and menopausal women who uh, would might only lose, you know, one or two kilograms, uh, you know, compared to their their husband who's just lost ten kilograms on exactly the same diet. But that happened to, uh, to my wife, and I had to stop telling her how much weight I was losing because she was getting more and more pissed off. But um, um, you know, it uh, it's a fact, you know, isn't it? That, that for many women, not all, but for many women, 
um, simply just going uh, low carb is is not enough. And um, and I think you've you've you know explained it very well that uh, maybe the next step after they try their you know get onto the low carb diet for for a few months is to try um, both the time restricted eating and and, and some prolonged uh, fast as a is that your basically your approach to to, to someone who comes in with you know a, a tale of oh, I'm, I'm a bit low carb for three months I've lost you know one kilogram and, uh, and it's plateaued and, and I can't lose anymore. Yes, yeah, so it, it's it's certainly the approach that we take is to look at diet first and then apply these strategies like um, fasting as well. But where the, it, it is also often the case that there's a lot of women that this doesn't tend to provide success for, and it's it's really achieving weight stagnation in a sense because often it is about the the weight gain that they've had but so they'll report to us that okay well they now feel stable they're not gaining weight anymore which is excellent um, and they might have had a slight reduction but the next step also is to look at um, how they're whether they're still experiencing any other symptoms that are associated with menopause so some of those hallmark features are these group of symptoms called vasomotor changes, which are things like hot flushes and night sweats. And these can be quite severe, particularly at night time, and that causes a lot of sleep disturbance for women. And when you're underslept, you have higher levels of cortisol. And the cortisol basically competes with your um, uh, production of DHEAS, in the adrenal gland. And we need that DHEAS to produce uh, some of our remaining estrone or the, the only estrogen that we'll have after menopause. So that also, the high cortisol levels from, um, forces our livers to produce glucose through a process we call gluconeogenesis. And so kind of from two different as angles are getting um, bombarded within your body with these higher levels of glucose. and that's actually, you know, despite your lovely dietary changes that you've already applied. So that's when I would start to suggest whether or not it's worth treating the symptoms of menopause because we have um, uh, some therapies, particularly with hormone replacement therapies, that can be really quite powerful and impactful for women who are at this time in their lives, particularly within the first 10 years of menopause, to try and alleviate some of the symptoms that can actually be the problem for why a woman is not actually losing the weight. So there are also some major benefits as well that women can consider when they think about uh, hormone replacement therapy, or it was formerly known as hormone replacement therapy. It's now been renamed to menopause replacement therapy. So the benefits that some women can have is that we when we get a reduction in estrogen at menopause, our um, ability to synthesize new bone or what they call it bone mineralization disappears. And what we're left with then is this dramatic decline in our bone density, which will be ongoing for the rest of, uh, rest of a woman's life. And one of the major benefits that have, has appeared with the use of uh, hormone replacement therapy or menopause replacement therapy is the ability to prolong not only uh, your bone density, but the ability to keep continue continuous remineralization of your bones. So instead of really approaching osteoporosis in your 50s, you're really delaying that into your well into the 80s or 90s, which is a, a wonderful thing for women in terms of bone health. And it can also help with muscle strength as well. So these are some side benefits that come with the use of uh, such therapies and uh, Often, I think it's really worth addressing in women what are the other issues that are happening around the time of menopause because there are often quite a lot of stresses involved at this time, not only from the symptoms that they're experiencing, but also from the mere fact that women are often caught in between multiple generations. They might be caring for older, uh, for their parents, and they have younger children and they're in a busy um, work schedule. So there is also an emphasis on how can a woman slow down and still engage in really um, beneficial activities that are good for the mind and the body and in, in reduction of stress. And so, yes, imp improving sleep, uh, reducing stress, um, addressing alcohol intake, 
And uh, many of these uh, aspects are also really important around the time of menopause to then trigger further weight loss if that's, if that's what uh, they're, they're also looking for. So HRT, or is it MRT as it's called now, has had a bit of a bad rap over the, over the years. I mean, uh, you know, concerns about links to, uh, to various uh, medical issues, cancer and so on. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you say? Say to people who, uh, you know, say, well, you know, my previous doctor told me uh, not to take HRT. Yes, it's a really sad, the reputation that um, MHT has these days. And I think some of that is starting to un be um, unwound, which is good. So what it all arcs back to is um, the original studies around MHT was the Nurses' Health Study, and that was in the 80s and 90s. And that's actually at a time when many, many women were on uh, hormone therapy and uh, we had the observation that the women who were taking that actually had reduced cardiovascular disease and um, outcomes that were a sequela of that. So then uh, the Women's Health Initiative was developed, which was actually two types of randomised controlled trials where they were comparing women who were on oestrogen only therapy with a placebo and then in the other trial, it was estrogen plus progesterone therapy versus a placebo. And looking at, um, you know, what uh, impacts that had primarily on uh, cardiovascular disease. Now, this uh, study is one of the longest running studies for any women, um, of women. And it studied, I think, more than 27,000 women as well through um, quite a, a long running time. I think it was about 10 to 15 years that it ran for. But it got halted in 2002 when they saw there was a slightly increased risk of breast cancer. And unfortunately, that's where this bad reputation comes back to, which is the interpretation of this uh, data. So what, what we did see was that uh, there was um, what was reported, or at least in the news, was that there was a 24 to 25% increased risk of breast cancer for the women who were taking both the estrogen and progesterone in that particular study. So when you go back and look at the data, that was actually the reporting of the uh, relative uh, risk. And so it sounded quite alarming. But what, what it actually was in um, the absolute risk was really just a 0.1% increase. So to put that into practical numbers, that was looking at a woman who had a four in 1,000 or four women out of a thousand women in a year would develop breast cancer uh, in the placebo arm versus the five in out of a thousand women in the arm on HRT. So that was when you present those facts to a woman and who is really debilitated by the symptoms of menopause, it suddenly starts to look like it's it's actually not that much more of a risk. I mean, we we commit to to uh, surgeries or, you know, a day procedures like a colonoscopy where there's a one in a thousand risk of bowel perforation without even reading the consent form properly to, to see that there is that risk. So we, we know that um, what really improves the quality, the quality of life of women around this time and addresses their menopause symptoms can change their happiness and their ability to thrive versus this sort of risk that's quite small and it was unfortunately overblown and really scared away a lot of women and uh, left a generation of women without um, access to to this type of therapy um, leading to you know a, a whole a whole host of other issues for those women um, particularly around osteoporosis so i think we now know a lot better we also have very different preparations in terms of what hormones we choose to use the ones that were used back then in the women's health initiative are or were um, preg pregnant mare urine which is conjugated equine estrogen and that's actually a, a form of that uh, or half of that is a form of estrone that type of estrogen that we really don't like so much because it does lead to the the visceral fat and uh, visceral fat formation and um the progesterone used was a synthetic progesterone that we now no longer use. So in some ways, the findings of that study, they're, they're now well outdated and we're very unlikely to have another study of that scale uh, done for the modern day preparations that we have for um, replacement of hormones. 
But we do know that from the observational studies of these newer hormones that they have a much safer profile, much, much safer profile across the board. So I feel like all women should be presented with this as an option because it's certainly um, a something that we need an informed decision about. And I think if women knew the true risks associated with it that are not sensationalised by the media, then they would be able to make a really good decision for themselves. Right. Okay. So if, if I could just summarise, you know, the the issues around menopause and perimenopausal, perimenopausal symptoms, we're looking at uh, diet. So reducing the uh, the carbohydrate and the inflammatory content of, of diet, introducing fasting, whether that be time restricted eating or some prolonged uh, fast, and the potential for uh, for um, MHT, menopausal hormone treatment. So they're really our three sort of uh, options, if you like, to uh, to tackle these these you know problems that seem to be so widespread in our community. Is that a fair sort of summary? Yes, it's a fair summary, and uh, there's of course um, the additions of factoring in your environment as well, and and your environmental exposures, and as well, and also not forgetting uh, sleep and the power of sleep and how much that can be improved and prioritised around the time of menopause. Exactly, sure. But it's a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some of these other things improve sleep and then sleep improves your health and, and so on. But uh, sleep, and, and we shouldn't ignore exercise as well. Um, you know, as a sports yes. physician, I have to, uh, I have to keep, uh, you know, uh, recommending exercise, and, uh, which, as we know, is not necessarily that, uh, that good for weight loss, but uh, very beneficial for many other, you know, cardiovascular and, uh, and other, uh, other areas. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we didn't get much time to talk about that, but it's a very important thing, particularly for women around that time, because if they aren't going on to MHT, they have to be aware that the bone density you have at the time you cross over into menopause is what you're left with. And the only way to maintain that is by strengthening your muscles and improving your muscle mass. So that's actually a very important um, aspect, particularly the focus not just on walking and, and running and jogging, but on resistance exercise. So those push, pull, uh, lifting movements. Yeah, really important. I think and both males and females in, in, in older age, you know, you, you tend to lose uh, lose muscle strength with age and uh, you need to counter that by, by doing resistance exercise. Now, the problem is that... Uh, you know, women think of resistance exercise as, you know, going to a gym and, you know, pumping iron and, and you know, loud music and all that sort of uh, things that put you off going to going to gyms and so on. Whereas really it's just uh, things around the house, carrying your shopping, all sorts of, you know, things you can do to, uh, to, to build or to retain muscle mass just with everyday activities. Absolutely. I think it's the functional movements that are most important. You want to be that person who can get out of a chair without grabbing onto everything to get out. And, and it's really about using your own body weight. So you don't even necessarily need to have all those fancy extra weights to, to achieve these things. And I think the insulin sensitivity that is in, um, increases when you have uh, increase in your lean muscle mass and the ability for your muscle cells to take on stored glucose. So this is the glycogen um, increases as well. So it's a great reservoir or a sponge, if you like, for blood sugar. Great. Terrific. So we've got, we've got diet, we've got uh, fasting, we've got hormones, we've got sleep, we've got exercise. And uh, that's the pillars of really uh, tackling these sort of issues. And I hope that answers a lot of the questions. Um, we've just got, uh, you know, a few minutes left and... Uh, ton of questions here i don't really know where to start to be honest as always we uh, we have uh, a couple of questions about uh, about lipids about cholesterol and hgl um you know one uh, one listener asking uh saying that uh, no matter what she does low carb she can't get her hdl any higher than uh, than one um and uh, is frustrated with that because her triglyceride hdl ratio is not improving uh, that much so any sort of comments on on the impact of, uh, of diet on hdl which for those you know who are not aware it's traditionally been called the, the good cholesterol uh, that's a horrible term but it's uh, it's what people sort of uh, identify with and uh, the higher the uh, that's the one thing that's uh, the higher the better mm. i mean there's multiple factors that you'd have to consider there i mean one is uh, are the triglycerides still very elevated? So that would still need to be addressed by maintaining as much as possible a very low carbohydrate approach. 
uh, because we know that when you're consuming a lot of glucose, that's going to convert over into the triglycerides and, and therefore use up a lot of your HDL because you need to actually donate a HDL molecule to your triglycerides to clear it. So, or to clear it from the, the bloodstream and, and for it to be eliminated. The other thing is that there are certain medications uh, such as diuretics and, and beta blockers that can contribute to low HDLs. And so this could be a discussion that you can have with your doctor about whether there are any medications that you're on that are potentially suppressing the HDL production. And I think beyond that, you know, there are some, some rare genetic uh, issues which you'd normally be aware of by now, but, uh, but that could be affecting, particularly in that person's case. And um, I think the other thing to say is that clinically I see that HDL tends to drop or oh, sorry, it tends to rise slower when someone is on a low carbohydrate diet as opposed to triglycerides, which tend to drop very, very, very quickly. Um, and so that's just the other thing about, depends on how long you've been low carb, you might want to hang in there, persist. And we always have to be, uh, keep an open mind that one singular parameter doesn't mean everything. It's also about the the whole person and how you're feeling with this approach and where and, and how your general health and health is going. Because if you feel well, that's a very, very important uh, thing that can't be undermined. And we can get very fixated on cholesterol profiles alone and treating them somewhat um, in silos. So I think we need to still be cognizant that there could be all these other amazing changes happening in this person, but just for some reason, this HDL is still not budging and, and that could just be time. Right. There are a couple more questions on, on menopause. So let's just get back to that. Um, Petra wanted to know, as women need testosterone as well as the estrogen and progesterone, can we get testosterone on prescription in Australia as well as the other two as part of menopause therapy? What, what's your view on testosterone for women? Yeah. So testosterone replacement therapy is available for women and it's um, at the moment only got approval in the context of uh, low libido or no libido. So it's that hyposexual uh, function that's affected. And uh, the, it, there is an increasing and in, in emerging evidence that actually testosterone is very useful in replacement for women for other uh, aspects such as cognitive health um, and for energy levels. And anecdotally, I mean, these are just, things I've seen in my clinic, the women who happen to be taking testosterone replacement therapy report uh, wonderful um, general health. But importantly, the one thing that they tend to come back to is that they just feel more energetic and uh, they have greater energy. So it seems to be that response to uh, testosterone that comes across from the women who are taking it. It does need to be done uh, carefully and um, guided by a doctor who understands um, how to dose uh, the testosterone therapy and also uh, recognising that women don't need very high amounts of it. So it's a very, very minute amounts that, that are required um, in women. And yes, yes, it is actually something that women do have. Uh, so it's not an exclusively male hormone. Okay, we've got one minute left, a quickie. Liz, 61-year-old, type 2 diabetic, having a total hysterectomy soon. Sounds like MRT is the way to go, correct? So it depends on what type of hysterectomy. I mean, these days, if the hysterectomy is uh, sparing the ovaries, and, and I think you said they're 61? 61. 61, yeah. Yep. 61, okay. So, I mean, presumably this person has either gone through menopause or they're probably a a very late in the perimenopause sort of scene. Uh, but um, I think if you're having a hysterectomy, in some ways, that means if you do transition to hormone replacement therapy, you won't actually need to replace progesterone. So progesterone really in, in all the combinations for um, hormone replacement is only required to protect the uterus from um, unregulated growth of mm. the lining. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, so really you're only just needing estrogen. And actually, in fact, in all the Women's Health Initiative trials, uh, their um, all-cause mortality 
uh, was tracked for women who were commencing their um, hormone replacement within 10 years of um, uh, of menopause. And they found that those women who were on the estrogen only um, part of the trial actually tended to do better. So uh, across the board for all cause mortality. So it's a, it's the kind of, um, it's the, I would say, you know, if someone is only needing to use estrogen, it really reduces some of the noise from what, what is required in the body. And you just don't, yeah, that it's, it's actually nice to be on less, to be on less than, than having to be on both the combined treatments. Fantastic. We're out of time, Deepa. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot myself and I hope, uh, I'm sure our, uh, our listeners have, uh, have learned a lot as well. Um, we're going to keep uh, working on the Defeat Diabetes Program, uh, which we really believe in, and, and it's going to uh, address a lot of the issues that you've talked about tonight with uh, with low carb and anti inflammatory sort of uh, uh, food. So uh, I could you know couldn't uh, recommend more to adopting the uh, Defeat Diabetes Program. So if you're interested, and you're not already a member, and uh, go to defeatdiabetes.com.au and uh, you can uh, read all about it, and uh, it can make a, a big difference to you. But uh, deeper. So that was fa fantastic. We'd love to get you back on at some stage. I think there's lots more to talk about with women's health. But uh, for this time, thank you again. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.